This is the Just Steph Show, and I'm your host, Steph Palermo, your Italian Boston girl who's an empath, healer, and all-around seeker of wisdom. Tune in weekly for advice on how to live your best life at work, home, or play so you can feel groovy every day. Today I have the chance to speak with Gloucester Mayor Safathia Romeo Taken. She's an amazing woman who is tied to this community since the day she was born. And she has so much to tell us about Gloucester. So I am thrilled to be speaking with her today. And really, a trip to Gloucester without speaking to her would not be a trip at all. So let's go. Thank you so much for um, talking with me today. You know, um, my show is just, we're, I'm going around to various towns and, and highlighting, um, you know, some of the things that are happening in the different towns. I did one in the North End, I did Medford, and uh, I'm actually very attracted to Gloucester in the sense that my grandfather's family came from Shaka. Yeah, which and, is a lot here. Yeah. Right, right. I actually just met somebody from uh, Shaka, and the, you know what else I hear? Everyone loves you. You know what? If everyone loves you, you're not a good mayor. There you go. Well, everyone I talk to. Okay. How's that? So it's probably I, all my family, but that's all right. <laughs> there you go. Right. You got to have your family. That's right. Um, I try. I was a city councilor uh, previous to being a mayor, and then I was a healthcare advocate. So I've been in. I was born and raised in Gloucester, but I've been involved in the community um, for in healthcare for over 20 years. Um, I'm still involved in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, I volunteer on Fridays. I say we close here at 12:30 because mm -hmm. we stay late on Thursday nights and. I run down the cafe, get a double shot of espresso, uh -huh. do some energy, and then I go volunteer at the senior center because I'm a certified shine. They believe, they know that I'm the only mayor in Massachusetts who's certified, but they believe in the whole United States. Don't you feel that a lot of the the other um, countries around the world, they, they hold their elders in high esteem, and a lot of times Americans have sort of let that go, where I know that with my grandparents, but they were very important know, to us. not no more. You don't, you think? You know, I think, you know what? I, 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 I really thought that that's how it was. It was. That everywhere, it wasn't just um, European countries. Um, I know European countries did, um, you know, being Italian raised here, um, yes, your grandmother and grandparents were number one and you listened to them no matter Absolutely. what. Absolutely. You listened to them before you listened to your parents. I agree. That was everywhere and I see the disconnect everywhere. I see the disconnect everywhere. I, um, in my travels, I've seen disconnect. Oh, you're saying they're disconnected even over, you know, in Europe, the, in Europe and yeah. in, in Asia. Yeah, and yeah, it's not. I, I um, we have a lot of um, networking and a lot of uh, Chinese delegation that comes here, and we talk about it too. And the same thing. First thing we talk about is there's no respect like there used to be. Right. It really isn't. I think with social media, we tend not to spend time with our grandparents. I think we don't want to spend time with each other to be truthful. And it's, I don't think the grandparents are, are interested in you saying yes and no and please and thank you. I think they just want to see you. Oh, absolutely. And, and we don't have time. And that's what's wrong with this country and everywhere. Gloucester is just so unique. Believe me, uh, we bitch, we argue. But when there's a need, Everybody comes together. Everyone comes together. I was first. reading that about, you know, how... And it's actually the feel that I'm getting being here. Everybody sort of comes together. And I'm not sure I'm seeing that anywhere else, to be honest with you. I know. That's why I said to people, we don't care who's at the White House, because we live on this side of the bridge and we're not going anywhere. Right. You know, we're doing what we need to do to, for everyone here. And, you know, there's so much negativity. So much. So much. And, and, and when I cross that bridge, I'm going like, oh, I want to go back home. Because, you know, I'm so proud of my city. You know, we we have diversity here, and, and we have a lot of uh, different cultures, but we hold it together. We really do hold it together, and it's just, we embrace one another, and especially in time of need, and it's just amazing. And you know what, we have a philanthropy here that is just so amazing. So let me ask you this, um, how much does the tourism impact the city's income? It does a lot. Our beaches, it, it, it affects quite a bit. It affects quite a bit. Uh, between the hotel taxes and the beach revenue and all the money that they spend here, it's, we're, I'm trying to beat Kim Driscoll. I'm hoping this year Mott tells me that um, we're number one, but she was number one and we're number two as far as spending revenue. Right. And I said, damn, I'm never going to be number two. I've got to get that number one and we're doing that and we're trying to do that. I says, wait a minute, we joke around. I says, you have witches and we have bitches, I mean beaches. <laughs> 
now, why aren't we, uh, why aren't we uh, getting more money than you? But um, because the fact is, um, you know what? It's, it's, we all actually compliment one another. And I'm glad that, you know, we're all doing well and because we all struggle together too when it comes in the winter. We need our good weather. We need the tourism. We need that. We now have a new boating system where you can actually go online. We've had over 600 captains and don't forget the crew and come in and we, we have our moorings and we have now discovered Gloucester because we take a percentage right. um, out of our tourism tax that, you know, for hotel and motel. And we give it right in line item right to the Discover Gloucester so they can actually promote, promote the city. People, you know what, uh, and I know right now everyone's happy, but I'm going to get that phone call, you know. Hit, I'm stuck at the traffic lights, I'm stuck at the beach, I'm stuck here, you know, the traffic's bad, uh, you know, why aren't you putting signs here, why aren't you doing this, and all of this other stuff. And you know what, and I say, people, remember. Oh, we don't need that. You keep promoting Gloucester. We don't need you to promote Gloucester. Stop promoting Gloucester. We're getting too many tourism. I said, but you know what? All these restaurants and all these stores that donate to your PTOs, that donate to your programs in the winter, get the money in the summer in order to do that. Exactly. So we're just saying thank you backwards. I, I'm gonna, I have to sidetrack you a little bit because okay. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very curious about this. As a female entrepreneur and as a woman in place of leadership, how are you helping other women to in, in Gloucester to maybe own their own businesses and and, and well, I was um, I owned my own business. Um, I, I was vice president of Fishman's Wives, and it was difficult when you were fighting regulations. And so it would be like me and Angela Sanfilippo, who's the president and the board, would be going to all these meetings. We'd be the only females with six, seven, eight hundred men. And they used to, a lot of them used to get angry and say, go back in the kitchen. I mean, I've heard it all. I've heard it all, believe me. Uh, go do your cookbooks, because the Fisherman's Wife has great cookbooks. And, you know, and then just stay stronger. But to the point that, you know what, I didn't feel that women were having a voice, or in a matter of fact, not just women, but also uh, minorities. Um, and so I decided to run for office in 2011 as a city councilor. And my logo was, you know, uh, let your voice be heard. I'm also going to the schools and telling young women you can be and have them come here. What do you want to be when you grow up? You can do all of that. I belong for, um, we have a program here that's called, you know, Streets for Women Businesses. And the state actually is embracing that and giving right. out loans for, um, yeah. for women right. who want to uh, open small businesses. And so what we did on Small Business Week, we actually um, went to all the businesses in Gloucester and for the ones who were female owned, um, we said, did you know that these programs, we can help you to enhance it, and we do that. And then we have uh, women who just did the Bayou, who just did this little Cape Ann travel, um, which were all uh, small businesses and all women owned. And I belonged from a status commission for the women. I was elected to be a member of that, and we really promote women in everything, in politics and business and education and everything you can think of. It's, you know, really... It's hard. I tell it people, um, when I started in healthcare, I had to go promote um, some of the stuff that we're doing, and um, it was difficult, first of all, being a woman and being a minority was even, and back then, believe me, uh, people say, well, you're not a minority or Italian. Well, I'm sorry, but when you were raised in a community and there was no one else except, you know, Italian um, uh, or Portuguese, and we were called Guineas. And they were called, you know, uh, Portuguese, Portuguese, you know, it, it was hard. Um, Portuguese and all of that. Um, it was very difficult. And they still say the G word. I hate it. I, I do too. And, and, you know, they still say the G word. And when someone made a remark, as well, how many guineas are in that office? And I went, excuse me? Excuse Why isn't that racist? I said, especially for Sicilians. You know what Sicilians were, why they call us guineas? Well, look at the definition. It's not the fact that, you know, they're saying we're not, you, you know, the uh, Sicilians are not white. I don't care about that. That doesn't even bother me because I think my complexion, all of color is beautiful. Mm -hmm. it, the fact is using the guinea was, is a slang. It was, it was, it, we were part of Africa and you're using it instead of the N word, the G word, but it's okay now. That really, really, that's one of the things that I can't stand. It's not okay. It's not okay, and I hate, I hate when they say a black person uh, is this way or a white person killed this or a fat or skinny, whatever. You know what? Women in general are having it hot as it is. Please don't label us even more. Just being, you know, one of the statistics of being a woman and trying to get ahead is so difficult. I hate labels. You know what? I love everyone. I really do. Even the ones who say some nasty things, I look at them and go, like, something must be wrong in their lives that they have to be this negative. 
whether it's mental health, whether it's addiction, whether it's female, whether it's transgender, gays, whatever, it's the stigma that people aren't coming forward to be themselves is because they don't want to be labeled, uh, you know, with depression or a mental a mental illness. They don't want anyone to know they have an addiction or, or anything else, so they're not really seeking the help they want to see. I have people telling me they have children waiting 13 days in the emergency room to be seen, six months before they can even get a children's therapist. If anything, this country is doing, we're all fighting opioid issues. We all are. Why are we fighting those issues? Because we're not taking care of the children when they have the mental problems to begin with. A child who has a mental problem and is not being seen ends up either hurting themselves, hurting others, or going into drugs. And so let me tell you something. 1997, I was dealing with that issue. 21 years, and we're still dealing with that issue. I am trying to bring awareness, and I, I mean, I believe me, I, being called a guinea is nothing, or being a female is nothing, and this is nothing, is when you see a child hurting that much, goes into the schools, and, 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 and they have these lockdowns now that they'll take a child out, there's no follow-up. So this child will go to uh, try to wait and to get into a, a, a place to be seen. There's no juvenile beds. We just did another 20 in Salem. Um, and it's not enough. And isn't that sad that there's not enough therapist to handle our children or beds to help them. We had the shortest of opioid beds. We all got together and now we have more rehabs, more beds, more awareness, everyone, the whole country, not just in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And yet no one's really looking at the mental health issues again because that's how you're going to stop those old years. So uh, now that we're talking about this, uh, it was, what's coming to my mind and my heart is, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, you know, nobody went to see a therapist. No. It was, it was, it was taboo. Yeah. Okay. So did we have less mental illness problems back then because of the family values and the people sitting down at the table together? Or did we have them as much as they, but nobody talked about it? Nobody talked about it. No one ever talked about cancer. If you had cancer, yeah, yeah, it was like, yeah. no one ever yeah. talked about that either. You didn't say it, it. No, it was I the know. culture of the person, the culture of the families. Uh, you didn't talk about it. Uh, in Italian, you know, um, it was difficult if, you know, no one talked about if someone was uh, being hit or someone was being abused. Nobody talked about anything. No. They didn't talk about mental right. issues. And they didn't talk about cancer. It was like, oh my God, you have cancer. You're, you're going to pass it on. So, um, no, it, there was, it was there. But you know what? I was looking at a lot of. Um, my uh, friends and we're sitting down talking we're looking at some pictures and it says well remember this one they called uh, Floyd the Clem Digger or Rosie Crud or all this I said I bet you you know what I bet you they had dementia or Alzheimer's because I remember this certain woman was fine and then she lost her husband and then slowly she started changing and everyone just oh look she's nuts I bet you she had Alzheimer's she we just, just didn't know what it was right nobody knew what it was they think oh they're she's nuts and then you stay away and that was it, you know. Um, children, we had uh, children. I, I mean, my friend um, in eighth grade, he killed himself. The, the, of course, there had to be something, but no one talked about it. You know, you put up the picture in the, the eighth grade yearbook, you did a little memorial, and that was it. I mean, the, you know what? It, it was, you don't talk about it. And I'm sure that it was the same exact thing is that either they are, they either killed themselves as adults um, or something worse, or eventually, and back then there was more alcoholism than it is opioid, so we all thought everyone was an alcoholic for a reason, and we know why the reason. It's because it must have had some kind of problem. You just don't sit there today, I'm gonna to drink a bottle of wine every day, or I'm gonna take this first shot of heroin, there's gotta be something. And in society, what we have here is to say that we don't have juvenile therapists. We do, but we don't. And, uh, Secretary Sutter said, it's not a shortest of therapists. It's a shot that they don't take health insurance. Yeah, so that's like plastic paid. surgery. Right. So if you got the right. money, you're going to get a facelift. Right. So if I have the money, I get to see a therapist. But where are they? Because I have parents who say, I'll pay. Yeah, we all pull together. Is it the way we're paying them? Is it the way insurance paying them? Now, shouldn't we demand this in the state of Massachusetts or the whole country saying, if we're all having these issues of opioid crisis, we know then there's a problem somewhere. whether it's addiction, whether it's female, whether it's transgender, gays, whatever, it's the stigma that people aren't coming forward to be themselves is because they don't want to be labeled, uh, you know, with depression or a mental, a mental illness. They don't want anyone to know they have an addiction or, or anything else, so they're not really seeking the help they want to see.